Question. The nurse is caring for a client who had a near drowning accident in cold weather. Which assessment finding indicates the most severe injury? 1. Decreased body temperature. 2. Toes pointed straight down. 3. Weak and thready pulse. 4. Wheezing on auscultation. Answer. Option 2 is correct. Explanation. Near drowning occurs when a client is underwater and unable to breathe for an extended period. In a matter of seconds, major body organs begin to shut down from lack of oxygen and permanent damage. Results. Decerebrate posturing is a sign of severe brain damage. During assessment, the nurse would observe arms and legs straight out, toes pointed down, and the head and neck arched back. These assessment findings indicate that severe injury has occurred. Option 1. Hypothermia is generally seen in near-drowning victims. One of the first goals of treatment is to warm the client. This is done using warmed IV fluids, blankets, and air. Sustained hypothermia will eventually lead to organ failure, making this an urgent finding but not initially life-threatening. Option 3. A weak and thready pulse is generally detected in near-drowning victims due to hypothermia. Once the client is properly warmed, the pulse generally returns to normal. Sometimes the client is so cold that a pulse cannot be detected. This is why a client is not dead until warm and dead. Such clients may require prolonged resuscitation. Option 4. When wheezing is heard on auscultation after a near drowning, the first observation would be that the client is still moving air and providing oxygen to the body. The wheezing may indicate that the client has bronchospasm. If the client has aspirated fluid, crackles would be heard. Most such clients will develop acute respiratory distress syndrome. Educational Objective Decerebrate posturing, arms and legs straight out, toes pointed down, head, neck arched back usually indicate severe brain injury. Question. A client who is two hours post-aortic valve replacement is in the intensive care unit. The low pressure alarm for the client's radial arterial line sounds. Which action should the nurse take first? 1. Check for bleeding at tube connection sites. 2. Perform a fast flush of the arterial line system. 3. Re-level the transducer to the phlebostatic axis. 4. Zero and rebalance the monitor and system. Answer. Option 1 is correct. Explanation. The low pressure alarm could signal hypotension. The nurse's first action should be to check the client for evidence of hypotension and the cause. Arterial lines carry the risk of hemorrhage and are most likely to occur at connection sites of the tubing and catheter. A client can lose a large amount of arterial blood in a short period of time. The nurse should verify that these connections are tight on admission of the client to the ICU. Option 2, a fast flush of the arterial line system, square wave test, should be performed after the nurse has ruled out a physiological cause of the low pressure alarm. This test helps to verify if the arterial line is functioning correctly. Option 3, the transducer should be leveled to the client's phlebostatic axis to measure arterial pressure correctly. However, this should be done after the client has been checked for a physiological cause of the alarm. Option 4, zeroing the monitor should be done if measurement accuracy is questioned. However, this should be done after the client has been taken care of. Educational Objective a low-pressure alarm for an arterial line can indicate the presence of hypotension or disconnected tubing. Hemorrhage can rapidly occur with a disconnected arterial catheter line. The nurse should check the client for the presence of hypotension and its causes before troubleshooting the system. Question. The nurse is caring for a client with sepsis and acute respiratory failure who was intubated and prescribed mechanical ventilation three days ago. The nurse assesses for which adverse effect associated with the administration of positive pressure ventilation. 1. Dehydration. 2. Hypokalamia. 3. Hypotension. 4. Increased cardiac output. Answer. Option 3 is correct. Explanation. Positive pressure ventilation delivers positive pressure to the lungs using a mechanical ventilator, either invasively through a tracheostomy or endotracheal tube or non-invasively through a nasal mask, face mask, nasal prongs, or a mouthpiece. 
The most common type used in the acute care setting for clients with acute respiratory failure is the volume cycled positive pressure MV, which delivers a preset volume and concentration of oxygen EEG, 21% to 100% with varying pressure. Positive pressure applied to the lungs compresses the thoracic vessels and increases intrathoracic pressure during inspiration. This leads to reduced venous return, ventricular preload, and cardiac output, which results in hypotension. The hypotensive effect of PPV is even greater in the presence of hypovolemia, EEG, hemorrhage, hypovolemic shock, and decreased venous tone, EEG, septic shock, neurogenic shock. Option 1. Fluid and or sodium retention usually occurs about 48 to 72 hours after initiation of PPV due to 1. Increased intrathoracic pressure and decreased cardiac output that stimulate the kidneys to release renin, 2. Physiologic stress that leads to the release of antidiuretic hormone and cortisol, and 3. Breathing through the ventilator's closed circuitry, which decreases insensible loss associated with respiration. Option 2. Hypokalamia is not associated with PPV. Option 4. PPV increases intrathoracic pressure and reduces venous return to the right side of the heart, reducing preload and cardiac output as well. Educational Objective Positive pressure ventilation causes increased intrathoracic pressure and reduced venous return and cardiac output, which can result in hypotension. Question The emergency department nurse is caring for a client who requires gastric lavage for a drug overdose. Which action would be appropriate? One. Lavage through a small bore nasogastric tube. 2. Place client in Trendelenburg position during lavage. 3. Prepare intubation and suction supplies at the bedside. 4. Wait an hour after gastric decompression to initiate lavage. Answer. Option 3 is correct. Explanation. Gastric lavage is performed through an orogastric tube to remove ingested toxins and irrigate the stomach. Gastric lavage is rarely performed as it is associated with a high risk of complications, e.g. aspiration, esophageal or gastric perforation, dysremias. Gastric lavage is only indicated if the overdose is potentially lethal and if gastric lavage can be initiated within one hour of the overdose. Activated charcoal administration is the standard treatment for overdose, but it is ineffective for some drugs, e.g. lithium, iron, alcohol. Intubation and suction supplies should always be available at the bedside during gastric lavage in case the client develops aspiration or respiratory distress, option 3. Option 1, gastric lavage is usually performed through a large bore 36 to 42 French orogastric tube so that a large volume of water or saline can be instilled in and out of the tube. Option 2, during gastric lavage, clients should be placed on their side or with the head of bed elevated to minimize aspiration risk. Option 4, gastric lavage should be initiated within one hour of overdose ingestion to be effective. The client's stomach should be decompressed first, but lavage should be initiated as soon as possible afterwards. Educational Objective Gastric lavage is used to remove ingested toxins and irrigate the stomach after a drug overdose. It should be initiated within one hour of overdose. The nurse should position the client to prevent aspiration and have emergency respiratory equipment at the bedside. Question. A registered nurse is precepting a new nurse in the intensive care unit. The client is sedated with propofol on a mechanical ventilator and is receiving enteral feeding via nasogastric tube. The new nurse performs interventions to prevent aspiration. The preceptor should intervene if the new nurse performs which of the following actions? 1. Assesses gastric residual volumes every 4 hours. 2. Measures the number of centimeters the feeding tube is secured at the nair every 4 hours. 3. Requests that the physician change the client from continual to bolus feedings. 4. Uses a sedation scale to titrate down the sedation if possible. Answer. Option 3 is correct. Explanation. Critically ill clients are at increased risk for aspiration of oropharyngeal secretions and gastric content. It is common in clients who are intubated, sedated on a mechanical ventilator, and receiving enteral feedings. The nurse must provide nursing interventions to prevent aspiration and monitor for its signs and symptoms. Clients are at increased risk when receiving bolus rather than continual enteral feedings. Bolus feedings should be avoided in critically ill clients, 
who are already at increased risk for aspiration. Option 1. Assessing gastric residual volumes according to institution policy at least every 4 hours is standard for clients receiving continual enteral feedings. Increased volumes may indicate poor absorption and increase the risk of regurgitation and aspiration. Option 2. Measuring the number of centimeters at the nair every 4 hours can help determine if the tube has moved, but it can increase aspiration risk. X-ray confirmation may be necessary if the tube has moved. Option 4. A sedation scale such as the Ramsey scale is used to assess level of sedation. It is preferable to keep the client minimally sedated, asleep but arousable. This helps decrease the risk of aspiration. Educational objective. Assessing gastric residual volumes and level of sedation at regular intervals, checking enteral feeding tube placement, and administering continual rather than bolus tube feeding are interventions that help prevent aspiration in critically ill high risk clients. Thank you for watching. Subscribe for more A World and Clex practice test.